Yeah, we on Boss Talk 101. Yeah, we gon' talk, we gon' have fun. We be on fire, we be lit lit. It's a unique hustle. Check it, check it, check it. It's a unique hustle. It's your boy, ECO, and I'm here with the lovely, amazing, official Miss Jamaica. What's going on? Walk on, you know my damn? Already, man. Hey, man, we got a guy here today, y'all. He really don't need no introduction. This guy right here, man, you know, if you see him at the improv, he gonna say something that he shouldn't be saying when you walk in with your wife. He gonna just go to talking crazy and say, man, you ain't name on the tip. You ain't name on the I'm like, nigga, what is you doing, bro? Talk to her. The nigga is here, y'all. He talked his way up on the set. Y'all would never guess who this is, man. Black Run is in the building, man. What's going on? Man, see, I don't even like how you... Check like it, how man. Stop that. playing with this dude when they come on like post talk, man. Uh, man. I, don't like, I don't like how you presented man. it to the people. But, but tell know, the truth then. I mean, you know, you know, I, I'll just say that that was a unique narrative. I'll put it like that. <laughs> no, I'll, I'll put no, it like no, that. no. Did it happen or did it not happen? I mean, when you when you say it like that, is the way how you say it, that's what he's saying. Yeah, it ain't, it ain't, it ain't the facts; it's the way you present it. <laughs> well, okay, give me your perspective. Okay, so I'll say it. Don't like worry this. about it, man. Let's get on with the show, man. Come on, Let man. Let him say his narrative. I'm trying to kill this nigga off don't right now. I got him on boss talk, baby. See, you see, you see how you do. You don't see how you do. do I love it, man. You see how you do. I love this man. It's I ain't the lack lie. of home training <laughs> that you have that I really don't appreciate. One no. one minute, <laughs> minute <laughs> not, not enough reason. Respect. Big up yourself. Yes, sir. Big up yourself. Man. Walk on. Thank you so much for coming on the show for Man, me. Man, I didn't do it for you. <laughs> you get more. You didn't make me feel welcome Say. or none of that. He gave me the wrong directions. <laughs> Say, listen, man. I'm going to be honest with you. I was really like, dang, who is this dude that really going to just bump, bump, just going to bump on me? And then my photographer, this dude, this videographer I got, he said, man, that's black. I'm like, nigga, who? He was mm -hmm. on me, man. So mm -hmm. ever then, so I went and did my research, man, and found out. And I, that night, man, dope show, man. I oh, appreciate you it. and Chico Bean, man. I ain't gonna lie, man. You know, um, it's certain shows I've watched there when people invite us down, mm -hmm. and that was one to be remembered, man. The way you you kept the the crowd involved, bro. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. You really, really put it down, you know, and and you know what you're doing. This is a gift. I remembered you from back over in. I think it was DeSoto or Duncanville. Which one? Duncanville. Was Duncanville. And you was over there. Legend. Yeah, man. Man, that's a long time ago, too. Long, long time ago. We came a long way from Legends, baby. I know Just it, man. Just to come right back to the improv. You see that? We went all the way around the world with the comedy, all the way around the world with Boss Talk. Come all the way back to the improv, and this nigga still don't know who I am. <laughs> Let's go, baby. Come on, get him. So... Where were you born and raised? Oak Cliff. Oak Cliff. Oak Cliff. I know you were saying that the other day. So what part of Oak Cliff? Well, okay, so came up, born in Singing Hills. Mm -hmm. Came up in a little bitty area right off of Keystone and Cockery Hill, known as Western Park. Mm -hmm. If you know about it, you know about it. You know what I'm saying? Did my tutelage over at Kimball High School. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Matriculated over to El Centro. Did graduated from Middle College High School, class of 2003. <laughs> After that, took up residence over in a little part of town known as Redbird. You understand what yeah. I'm saying? Got a little thugging and a little bit of bugging in over there off them Westmoreland and Wheatland streets. You feel me? And then after that, had a child in 2011. Started my comedy career in 2011, and the rest is history in the making. So hold on, okay, I'm gonna you ask don't let you. him get away that easy. We got no. Get I'm back gonna in get there. yeah. I'm gonna get back into that, but I want to ask you. So growing up, mm -hmm. um, I'm sure you didn't want to be a comedian as a kid growing up, right? No, nah, nobody wants to be a comedian at first. Okay, but you have a gift for gab, even even as a kid, right? Or were you a shy kid? No, never. Never a shy kid. Never was a shy kid. So if you have a gift for gab, tell me about a time where maybe you were about to get into a fight or you were about to, somebody was harassing you or whatever, and you had to use that gift to my, get out of it. <laughs> my gift for gab has gotten me in fights <laughs> and out of fights. Tell me, tell me, give me a story. Okay, I, I'll give you a story about the last fight I got into. When was that, last week? No, 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 we don't fight no more. Okay, just checking, because y'all were talking about y'all were talking we about that earlier. I fight cases, not people. Oh, okay. So, when I was still uh, engaging in pugilism, you know what I'm saying, a fan of the fisticuffs, as it were, 
I was 22 years old. I never okay. forget. I never forget. Uh, what what was it, Jay? Mother's Day? I think it was Mother's Day. Two you gonna fight, try to fight on Mother's Day? It was either Mother's Day or Easter. I want to say it was Mother's Day. Okay. Um. So came home that Sunday afternoon. Ain't got nothing to do. Don't nobody feel like playing basketball. We just going to go over to my partner crib, stay in the same apartment complex. We're going to smoke blunts, play mm -hmm. dominoes, bullshit the rest of the day away. Get over there. He already got company over there. It's one of his partners and his partner's OG. Okay. And they old ladies. Okay. Everybody over there having a good time. They playing Uno at first. Mm -hmm. We switch from the Uno to the dominoes. Okay. I'm on the domino table. I'm firing that ass up. I happen to have mastered in dominoes while attending Grambling State. But before that, I was already good because I'm from Oak Cliff. You know oh, what I'm saying? So everybody from Oak Cliff can play dominoes? Pretty much. Pretty much. We can either fight, run fast, or play dominoes. It's okay. one, you get one of them skills. Just it's, It come in the water that you okay. pipe through out of Five Mile Creek. But anyway... Um, so I'm whooping that ass on them dominoes quite effectively. Okay. So he want to start roasting. Mm. That's also something that we all are proficient at down in Oak Cliff, Texas. Mm. We'll roast the, the hair off your back. We mm. we on your ass like back pockets. I'm talking about we 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 I'm all quick all, with it. Quick. He want to roast. Okay. He didn't know that I'm good at this. Okay. Tan that ass up, but he in front of his old lady mm, mm, mm. and his OG. He can't lose. He shouldn't have started it. Now, why this grown ass man still had a, a growner man that he considered his OG around him and felt the need to impress him, I don't know. But, you see, you know, Mr. Jamaica, you done seen it. Mm -hmm. Whenever two dudes are roasting back and forth, arguing back and forth, doing anything com competition wise, back and forth in ego. front of a woman, mm -hmm. that ego. Mm -hmm. So now he want to start flexing on me. Mm -hmm. So I'm tearing his outfit up. So he go, whatever, nigga. I got a pocket full of money. I fire off. Well, take some of that money and go buy yourself some style. And that's when his old lady started laughing. And that's when. <laughs> and that's when that nigga snapped. He come across the table, come around the table, and I'm standing there, and I'm smoking a square. And I'm laughing, because I'm killing you, and we mm -hmm. having a good time. I didn't think it was finna get violent until mm -hmm. he got violent. And he was like, whatever nigga say something else, and I'll bust you in your mouth. And I looked that man dead in his face, and I said, something else, and I hit the square. Again, I looked off to blow the square, the smoke, because I, I wasn't gonna blow it in his face, so I ain't disrespecting you, I'm just tearing your ass up. Mm -hmm. Pause. So. As I look off. And he hits you. He fired off. Now he 5'9", five 5'8", five 240. He stocked it with it. He swung with all his might. He thought that was going to be enough to clean me up. I'm sitting here having an in, inner dialogue. Like, did this nigga just hit me? While I'm asking myself this question, he let go of another one. Foul. I say, that nigga did just hit us <laughs> twice. He get ready to file off the third one. And you ain't you ain't even gotten on the floor with I, them punches. I, I haven't even got into the fight with him yet. He mm. fighting me all by himself. I'm not even in the moment. Cause and you I'm let still, him hit, just hit you just I'm like that. I'm still rolling off of the fact that I just killed the room so hard I got your own lady laughing at you. Mm. So he get ready to throw the third one because now he mad that I ain't even wobbled, stumbled, or none of that. He didn't got two free clean ones. Mm -hmm. Now, I went into Super Saiyan mode. I don't remember what happened next in the fight. My brother told me the fight later on. He was like, man, I was sitting there wondering what the fuck was wrong with you. You just let Cud just spar off on you. He's like, then that nigga got ready to throw the third one, and you just weed at home and slapped that nigga hand down and fed that nigga three of them real, real fast. Now, I remember hitting him and then resetting when I reset, he realized, oh, no, he can fight, too. Mm -hmm. Now he won't play football. <laughs> tackle you. <laughs> now he want to tackle me, but I'm already in the corner, and my legs is already up against the chair. So there's nothing else. Yeah. So I ain't got nowhere to go. Mm -hmm. So now he want to bull rush me. I end up hitting my head on the microwave. Because mm. we, we in my partner's living room right by his kitchen. We right. tan, we fucking furniture up. I remember we destroyed that man's living room. He had a big-ass glass table. All of that was fucked it up. All the chairs. House. So 
the glass table hit me right here in my I head. I would have threw water on y'all. And the microwave hit me right here in the head. Wow. I remember, I remember. Did it slice you? No, it just, just left a, it left a permanent knot okay. right here, you know, war wound. So mm -hmm. I remember that his old lady, my partner who house we was over, had just had a baby a few months ago. Mm. So she was in the back tending to the baby and everything like that. She heard all this thumping and rumping going on in her living room. She come out, she screaming. She hysterical. Because we in there really fight. We mm -hmm. fight and fight. Mm -hmm. Fight get broke up. Now he mad because he ain't win the fight neither. You ain't win the roast contest. You done lost your pride in front of your old lady. Mm-hmm. I go back to my house because now I won't put on different clothes. I mm -hmm. wouldn't even dress to fight. Let me go get ready. Let me go get dressed and we can come back over here. And do it around too. And we can do this for real in this grass and all this air and this opportunity. We ain't got to we ain't got to get in no corner in the living room and my leg get tangled up in the chair. You know, like back in back in the cliff, everybody mama had these same chairs. They was brass and like they it had a back on it and then the legs and then the the bottom of the leg swooped down mm -hmm, into like mm -hmm. a little U and then on the bottom, mm -hmm. the bottom was connected with a little circle. So I know what it was all about. one little piece. Mm -hmm. So wasn't nowhere for my leg to go when it got, that's the only reason why I was on the ground. Otherwise I'd have just fed him till he was full mm -hmm. standing up. But now that we done stood up and recalibrated, come on, let's go fight for real. And my partner came over there and was like, bro, I know you don't want to let it go. But for me, please let it go. Because that nigga there, he not necessarily about that life. But the nigga that he with oh, is really about that life. And I don't want that nigga to do something to you trying to impress the nigga that he with. So for me, please, let it go. Mm -hmm. And you did. Because I didn't lose the fight. If I'd have lost, I'd have been like, hell no, nah, fuck that shit. I'm back over there. Nigga just got to show me. But I had won the fight, and I had won the roast. There was no reason for me to go back over there other than pride, and I had a mean-ass knot on my mm -hmm. shit. And I just want to I want to dirty your face up like mine is. Like, you you got to leave with a scar, too. Mm -hmm. But I left with a lesson. Niggas get in their feelings. They do. You, you should have already knew that. But then five years later, my comedy career started. Mm -hmm. So then I realized, oh, that skill that I had that always got me in the fights, that always got me out of trouble with principals and police officers and stuff like that, but always got me into it, you know what I'm saying, with, with gangsters and other It was for a reason. You were practicing. I was honing the skill I didn't know I, I had in the mm -hmm. bag. So where did you get it from? Your mama, daddy? Who was funny? Everybody. Everybody? I'm low-key like the third or fourth funniest person in my immediate family. Who's the funniest? My daddy is the funniest person in my family. Why? Because he raw like that. Really? Just my, off the dome? My daddy is hilarious. My daddy is one of the funniest dudes because he ain't never lying. Like, <laughs> he's being dead ass for real with you. But, like, the way he says stuff is just so for real that you can't help but laugh. And But my mama is, like, the witty person. Mm. Like, my mama going to say something slick and you going to walk off and you're like, wait a minute. You jabbed me right then. Like, so, like. Don't say nothing stupid in front of my mama. She's going to bring that back. Wait a minute, you said what? You you, you do, huh? <laughs> Wait a minute, run that back? Like, And then my little brother is actually funnier than me. Mm. Really? Is he going into the comedy too? Well, he, he did stand up for a little bit. Oh, for a little bit, so he stopped? Well, well because, because up music, he yeah, always had the same name. Everything was always Give him a made. shout out, man. I got to force you to give your brother a I, shout out. I, I, I was saying it while you were saying give me a what shout out. It? I said everything was always asthmatic. So that, shout out to my brother. Oh, asthmatic. hell no. He ain't been letting nothing happen. Yeah, that's you your right. He's your biological that. brother. Yeah, yeah. That's my biological brother. That's oh, how wow. I man. Yeah. I can't get my brother to do it. Now I'm jealous as hell right now. No, nah, because we always came up I can't up get my brother to do nothing. My brother was my first writing partner. That's hard. My brother was the first soundboard. My brother, that's how I knew I was funny enough to be on stage. Mm. We used to sit up in, at night and play a game called You Can't Make Me Laugh. Just and you my brother. You try to and be I. serious. Just my brother and I. We supposed to Who be. Who lost? It, so, this is how you play the game. You try to be serious. You no, tell no, no number one, you supposed to be in, you supposed to be getting with your ass to sleep. But we laying in the bed, staring at the ceiling. Look over like, bro, what? You want to play You Can't Make Me Laugh? Now we got to argue for about five minutes over whose turn it was last time we played. Where last time we left off, mm -hmm. whose turn it was. So we argue. So now let's just say it's my turn. I'm gonna I'm gonna try to say the funniest things I can. Mm -hmm. The minute you laugh, it's your turn. 
and we gonna play until we go to sleep. Mm. That's good. I don't care if it's a joke. You just shout out something funny like you got Tourette's, you fart, whatever it is. You can't make me laugh because <laughs> we got a whooping for laughing in church one time. Y'all try to mimic the pastor or something? No. No, we got whoopers at home for that. Because, <laughs> you know, old black folks don't like we mock nobody. Mm -hmm. So, so don't, don't, don't be mocking nobody. Especially the pastor. Don't, don't be mocking the pastor. So we, we, be at, we, we be at home playing, who is this from the church? And then we start doing something that they do. Mm -hmm. Like, we're going to shout like sister so-and-so. We're going to fall out like brother so-and-so. We're going to say something that this deacon I always say. But we was at church one time, and this lady fell during the laying of the hands you know, you're going get, to get a little mm -hmm. dose of that Holy, Holy Ghost. Ghost. Get your little dose of that Holy Ghost. But uh, she had walked up on the pulpit to give the guest pastor something and everything. He just grabbed her by her hand and hit her with a little bit of that Holy Ghost one time. And her foot slipped and didn't catch right there. But what nothing but the stirs going back down to the congregation that way. And she just <laughs> right back down to the, uh, to the congregation. And everything would have been cool if we hadn't never looked at each other. <laughs> And how old were y'all? Oh, I want to say we three years apart. So we was probably like eight and 11. Mm. Around about that time. Mm -mm -mm. Like, That's you know, as soon as it hit you, you sniggle. Mm -hmm. And your mama say, I, you better not. You, your mama be talking to her teeth. You better not, better laugh. not laugh. You better not laugh. And, and she knew y'all were going to laugh. She about a whole minute went by. We thought, it, we thought we had survived it. Because, you know, you look down, you sniggle a little bit, you get yourself together. Hmm. All right. I can go back to being a good child and look up and enjoy service a little bit. I then you look at him. That nigga, that nigga looked at me and we lost it. And we lost it so much that like we couldn't be contained. My mom was like, all right, that's enough. But it wasn't enough. We got to get a little bit more. I'm going to say that's all right when, when y'all get home. <laughs> I'm going to tear it up. Beat your ass as soon as we get to the house. And she wasn't playing. Ain't nothing funny then. <laughs> Joke over right then. <laughs> Let me ask you about um, your uh, just how how your career started. You know, like in the comedy mm -hmm. lane, like you you like really like. And when I say started, you, it already started. But just meeting with all of these people, man, to to know the Chico Beans, to know the Wild and Outcast, and mm -hmm. just to be done done the things that you're accomplishing need to be duly noted. So, I mean, without, I just without really, bragging. Without yeah, bragging. No, 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 no. You, uh, let me finish giving you kudos because, well, like I say, I, just seeing you, you know, in, in rap form after we had talked at the comedy show. Right. I found out that, you know, I was talking to a guy that really, really was, was that guy, you know? Mm -hmm. So I really respect that man. I and that. and I, how could I slipped up and not known? I'm supposed to know that. You know what I'm saying? I'm rocking with them boys. Carlos been on here. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? People that have been through here. Shout out to my boys. Uh, Carlos Miller, uh, Chico Bean, he got, they called me. Like, we, we know that this is going down over here. So them guys mean a lot to me. I should have been up on it. So. Mm -hmm. And Alex Thomas, you and him was on yep. the same type show. I should have seen that. And I'm like, damn. Well, like, and Alex did plenty of shows together, actually. Yeah, Alex is a good one. I had on here uh, um, Bubba Dub, one of them. Yep. That's my guy. Like, I, and for some reason, this show uh, has become a base for the comedian. Fades on love. You, you mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? So I know that. So I embraced that because I knew that that was an open lane for that. The respect that was due on a noted platform in this market wasn't here. So I knew when I went, I was going to go get them guys. That That's I why I rolled up on you the way I did. Because I was like, because at first when you were doing Boss Talk, you know, you were interviewing, you know, street cats, yeah, yeah. you know, self-made men, yeah. ballers, hustlers. So it really wasn't a space for cats in my realm. Yeah. Then I look around, you got one comedian on here. I'm like, okay, that's cool. Cheating ass Myron. Yeah, you know, yeah, cheating ass Myron on Jesse there. Then, 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 then you go to Jesse. I'm like, well, you know, you know, Jesse handicapped capable, so he might have been doing something for the disabled. You know what I'm saying? You had Country Wayne on here. I'm like, well, you know, Country Wayne self made millionaire. He the first internet millionaire. You know that. You know his reason. But then, then you start like just all the niggas that work but with me. We had Phase on before we even had him. That's yeah. the, and then that's what I'm saying. So you got Phase on, Carlos. Chico, yeah, we kicking it. Bubba Doug, Alex, Alex, Alex Thomas, and I'm like, wait a minute. <laughs> I just got off the road with half Run of that G, list. Run G. Run G. Run G. Run G was only in town for two days. 
We did we them in LA. LA. <laughs> we be traveling that, okay, everywhere. That's crazy. <laughs> we went to LA. LA and done it. So, I hope in some of your homework that you did on me, you went and saw that I got some of the highest views at the Laugh Factory. Yeah, I seen mm-hmm. that. That was my. That was what I'm saying. That's how me and Run G are cool. So I'm like, that's when it start. That's when I start to take it personal. I'm like, <laughs> so so I feel like he. I feel like he fucking with everybody but me. So you know, maybe maybe it's because maybe it's because I never walked up and shook the man's hand and told him you know I like what he's doing. But but in telling you that I liked what you're doing, my feelings got in. I seen that. And I was like, hey man, I like what I'm you're like, doing. What the but fuck what you got going on. Why you ain't had me on there, baby? I'm him. Cause I don't like bragging, bro, but I'm I'm low-key the highest decorated black comedian from Dallas. And I used to say the highest decorated comedian from Dallas, but here lately, my man Ralph Bar- Barbosa okay. been tearing it up. So and he's here in Dallas? He, too? He's an Oak Cliff native on and he Shout out to my essays. That's also yeah. just as Oak Cliff as we are. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, but I like D. Ellis. Hey. I am he the Texas highest <laughs> decorated <laughs> comedian. I don't care who you finna name, that nigga don't have more credits than me. Yeah. 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 And the only credit that I that Ralph has that I don't have is, it's you know, what? Jimmy Fallon. He just performed on Jimmy oh, Fallon. Wow, that's big. He just got a write-up in the L.A. Times. That's big. Wow. He just got a write-up in Variety Magazine. That's hard. He just got through beefing with George Lopez. Really? You know what I'm saying? Because over the, what? Over the fact that George pulled an E.C. E.C. George, yo, he did nothing to you wrong. George didn't know who Ralph was. Oh, that's So they big. said, hey, George, what you think about the new kid, Ralph Barbosa? People saying he the next you. So he's like, who the fuck is Ralph Barbosa? <laughs> then he asked his assistant, you ever heard of a fucking Ralph Barbosa? <laughs> I ain't never heard of a goddamn <laughs> Ralph Barbosa. Not knowing that Ralph is the, 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 the new rising star and he's a Latino and he's always looked up to George. He's wow. always admired George. So you shitting on one of your, yeah. on, on one of your protégés fan, yeah. and biggest fans. Right. So when George found out about that, he called Ralph up personally. Wow. And was like, bro, I was just talking shit on a podcast, G. I, I genuinely did not know who you were, never heard of you. Shout out to you, young man. I see what you out here doing. Salute. That's that's and that and that that's 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 big that's because really big. the OGs really don't take that kind of humility when talking to us young cats. You yeah, know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. So but before this last three months mm-hmm. uh that, that Ralph been on this meteoric rise, Black Run was the highest decorated comedian from Dallas. But I think it also has to do with, because, you know, George Lopez, he's older. Right. You know, so, and then we are older, too. So it's a case no, where... No, don't put yourself in there with him. <laughs> Thank you, baby. Thank he you. old. Thank you, baby. Y'all, Mr. and Mrs. old. I appreciate you, baby. You know... So it's, it's a I case where... I don't remember what happened. A lot of times... A lot of times... <laughs> Oh, I can tell you what happened. Start loving you, feeding you all that cheese and grease and shit. Wouldn't let you put no Beijing in your bed. No, Dad, I like it with a little gray head. Oh, yeah. man. Yeah, turning into a pop I never, I never, I never did the faded, shaded thing. Bro, you never know why? Been. You know why? Because you yeah. had money and because and because your old lady is good looking. Anytime you are successful as a black man, you have no need to live a fake ass life. <laughs> Thank you so much, man. Yeah. And you was never tall, so you was already oh, secure in yourself. Oh, I always was cutting up. That's, That's how I know you can fight, because you, you, you maxed out at 5'9". A little bit of niggas, they either real insecure or real secure. Uh, and man, you never struck me as insecure. Lot, but you know what I think, why a lot of people, not him, but why a lot of people are now wearing their grays more, why? you know, men? Because of me. No, no, oh, no that's because that's because of Ronald Wesley at the Versus. Exactly. Wait a minute. Is, you see a lot of these young men who are actually having, you know, wearing their gray. Some people even dye their gray to have that sort of look, that GQ look. And females are going crazy. Everybody was hiding their grays until the quarantine. DMs. You know, you see the DMs. You know what's going down. I mean, they are they... Everybody hid their gray hair right. into the quarantine. Steve Not Harvey, me. Kevin Hart, P. Diddy, all the everybody. actors and uh, Jamie Foxx, everybody hid their grays mm-hmm. or shaved so you wouldn't know that they were Until quarantine. Yeah. Until the quarantine when the barbershops and the, and the beauticians was out of commission and, and your die girl couldn't get through there and that Just For Men don't really make it in that Hollywood Beijing shade that you need, that, that trick a nigga shade. Mm-hmm. So... They start wearing their grades. And on TikTok, you saw all them zaddies that they keep showing it everywhere. Wow. And that was nothing but a rollover of beard gang. 
<laughs> Y'all remember Mr. Steal Your Grandma? Yeah, 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 yeah. The yeah. teacher from Houston. Yeah. Man, they fucked around and showed a picture of that nigga, uh, his school ID picture without the beard. And everybody was like, ah, uh-uh, get my grandma back. <laughs> <laughs> hey, man, man, a beard gotta, make a man look grown. It I gotta distinguishes pull you us. back, man. Yeah. I gotta pull you back. I gotta talk about your career. I gotta talk about your accomplishments. My people need to know there's a lot of people that want to, you know, they want to do comedy. They want to be like you. You yeah. know what I mean? You got to give them the blueprint, print Black Run, to where they can learn, man. And you that, you the, you the go-through guy. <laughs> Don't do what I did. How long you been doing Why it now? You say 12 that? years. 12 years. You waited too years. late or something? Or? No, well, that. I felt like I waited about five years too late. But that's just my own little personal thing yeah. that I got to deal with with myself because mm-hmm. I, I never thought I was good enough to do this. Like, I'm funny at the barbecue. I can pull a girl. I'm good at a job. But professionally, I never considered myself a real comedian. Mm -hmm. Even after I was the best in Dallas and had been for years, I doubted myself. Mm. It's what took me so long to get on the road. It's what took me so long to get into competitions. But hold on. Where did that stem from? as As a child, were you raised like that to be fearful? No. It's, it, it, it so, was, you know, people say subconsciously, like, your mama said something, and you see kids hold that and feel, you know, self-confidence is not there because of that. No, that that wasn't where my fear lied. Where did it come from? My fear from? lied in, in the fact that when you go into something that's popularity-based, you have to be what people like. And when you come up being something that most people don't like, and that, that gives you the confidence to be yourself. Mm-hmm. But it also puts you in a place where you're scared to go where you have to get validation from others. Mm. So in comedy, as funny as you may think you are, you got to go on that stage and the people in that room are going to validate you. Mm-hmm. They're going to validate whether or not that's a good joke or not. Mm-hmm. So I had to, to deal with that. And then after growing up in church and you watching people that suck still get clapped for because it's the proper thing to do. Mm-hmm. Then you watch something like American Idol and a person like Simon tell a person, I don't know why you even thought to do this with your life. Right, well, forward. it's because they've been lied to the last 25 mm-hmm. years while they was at church saying, baby, you could be a star. You need to be in Hollywood. You need to be on TV. So I never let the locals people love for me give me an overinflated ego even though they were seeing something in me I didn't see in myself. Like, no, nah, bro, you got it. I'm like, I just got it to you. Because if I go to New York, I go to L.A., I go to Chicago, I go to Atlanta, places where comedy was supposedly mm-hmm. made mm-hmm. and validated, if I don't have it to them, I don't got it. Is it different in every state? Like when you're telling your jokes or when you go different places, do you have to switch up your jokes a little bit? Depends on where you are to cater to the people? Some things are regional. Okay. Certain logo, lingo, you know, uh, certain words that they call this, they call it something else in a mm-hmm. certain, another part of town. And you town. have to learn all of that. Right, like down here we say soda water. Mm. It's pop in other mm-hmm. places. It's Coke in other places. You know what I mean? So you gotta learn little, little interchangeable stuff like that. But for any comedian that's starting out, get away from telling jokes that are funny to the people around you because that's a joke you can't use nowhere else. Mm-hmm. Get away from using stores and places of business that are local to you. Because nobody else knows it. Ain't no Kroger in certain parts of the world. Right. You know what I mean? Ain't no Piggly Wiggly. Ain't no Win Dixie. You know what I mean? Like, if you ain't never been to Chicago, you've never heard of Jewel Osco. Mm-mm. But that's that's their grocery store. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? So get get away from that kind of stuff so then you don't compartmentalize yourself as as an act from this place. Mm-hmm. A local. Like I, I, I tell people all the time, I'm not a local comedian. I'm just mm-hmm. from here. I'm not really? a Dallas comedian. I'm, right. I'm a national, international comedian that's from Dallas. But mm-hmm. well, when you, how did you first get your, your you know, stem your relationship with some, like I said, the heavy hitters that you've already, and I, I asked you this and y'all keep going off subject. Yeah, because he sorry. told me to list my credits and my resume yeah. and tell people. I'm sorry. People so can, let, let, me, let me run it so down the, real, yeah, real quick. Like, and I really want to just dive into how you met them, the process. Because that's why I say I don't, I don't want nobody to take yeah. my route. Yeah, but the process for you to meet these people, for you to be this writer, mm-hmm. for you to be this guy, that stands on stage proud today, that was a process. Yes. And we need to hear the process. That's all I'm saying. So uh, it, it may not be a pretty picture, but no. we don't need to give people a pretty picture because a lot of times it's not going to be a pretty picture. Mm-hmm. So let's be real with the people so that they can learn. Because there's some guys that they they don't think that they can start at an age like you did as well. Oh, But man, then you give them encouragement. Rodney Dangerfield was in his 40s before he started his 
comedy wow. career. Sally Big. Field was 39 before she ever got cast in her first movie. You know mm. what I mean? 51 Savage was 51 before he ever went <laughs> viral. You know what I mean? Ch Two Chains was damn near 40 before his rap career yeah, yeah. really took off. So there is no like no specific time or, or, or time in your life to do something. If, if it's never too late to go back to college, it's never too late to start a new career path. So it's how old were you? I was 25 when I Which started. Which is good. For me, but you could have do this one earlier. I was just early. grown enough to have something to talk about. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So and and so when it takes off and you, how do you end up dealing with Wild and Out? How do you end up dealing with eighty five South guys like a Chico Bean? Uh, how do you end up meeting? Did you you and Ricky Smiley ever do some stuff together? I'm touring with Ricky right now. Okay, let's talk about this stuff, man. Let's get it out here. So shout out to Ricky Smiley. Shout out to Ricky Smiley, man. Uh, praying for you, dog. I, uh, yeah, yeah. Praying praying for you. He, he definitely been th going through something lately. I was about to say I went down there to uh, Birmingham and linked up with a few of his uh, people that he rocked with, huh? Mm -hmm. But let's talk about it. So shout out to comedian Ag White okay. from Brooklyn, New York. A.G. White was down uh, performing at Addison Improv. Then Lee was doing Fat Tuesdays. Yeah. I was a regular at Fat Tuesdays. I'm murdering it. Um, I featured right before A.G. went on stage. A.G. come tell me, dude, you dope. You need to leave Dallas. A year later, A.G. White comes back. I'm doing that same show. Mm. He said, yo, you been on the road? I said, nah, I ain't, I ain't had the chance. I ain't had the money to get out there. He said, yo, if I come back to Dallas <laughs> and, and you haven't you left here. Dallas, <laughs> lose my fucking number. Wow. Right after that, comedian Mario Torrey from Atlanta comes and performs at uh, Comedian Q. used to do a show called uh, We Got Next at, at Hyenas. Mm -hmm. So uh, Mario Torrey headlines. I, I feature for him. He said, man, if you ever in Atlanta, hit me up. I get a wild hair in my ass one day. Got a cousin that used to live in Atlanta. He said, man, if you ever in Atlanta, you got a place to stay. Got another dude to say, man, if you ever get down to Atlanta, I got $100 for you for every show you do. Wow. That's big. Next thing you know, I done bought myself a $40 Greyhound ticket to Atlanta. Rode that Greyhound bus 22 hours. Pull up in Atlanta. My man CJ come pick me up. Board me at his house. Go do Mario Toy's room. Go do all these rooms. Next thing you know, hey, man, you funny, bro. Hey, you need to come here. So when you go to a city and you wreck, all the comedians... Hey, Got another spot for you. You want fifty dollars in chicken wings? I, I got a spot for you tomorrow. I got a room I host. I got fifty dollars in chicken wings for you, so you can accumulate nice little rent money mm -hmm. and a nice little two week grind. You know, you do three, four rooms a night, two, three rooms a night for about two weeks, and you're in that town. Also, in that town is going to be somebody from somewhere else that's also in town knocking around. So mm -hmm. that's why your network starts to build. So I went from Atlanta to Chicago, from Chicago to New York, from New York to Detroit. Went all around. And you didn't come back home? Didn't come home until almost Christmas. So it was a whole year? No, I just, I would, I would pop back home, pay rent, okay. you know, see my lady, see my daughter, you know, get back on the road. Get home, comedy club that never gave me an opportunity, called me. The feature that they first called was sick. Second feature they called was out of town. Third feature they called couldn't get a ride. It was too last minute. God's plan. They called me. Hey, Black Ron, are you available to feature this weekend? No, the, the, the guy before me, he wasn't able to do it all weekend. That's what it was. Are you able to feature this weekend? Yeah. Um, six shows. You can do all weekend? Yeah. All right. Uh, first show is Thursday, 8 o'clock. Be here. You'll be featuring for Dick Gregory. Wow. Big. Man. We talking about my idol. Yes. So when they told you that, did you like flip out? Of course, not on the phone, but as soon as you hung up the phone. I would have flipped out if it weren't for the fact that I got walked into comedy by an idol. Yeah, mm. that's hard. First time I ever touched a comedy stage, I featured for Shucky Ducky. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah. Quack, so I was quack. already used to being around people that I admired for doing this, but I admired Dick Gregory for something way past comedy. Right. Yeah. I admired him for who Education. the man he was. You know what I'm saying? The, 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 the consciousness, the wokeness. Right. You know, that's why I followed Dick Gregory. Like, I was a disciple. So, that's hard. wait a minute, I know you lying to me. I, I think you pranking me. I'm thinking, y'all must be pranking me because my friends know that I fucks with Dick Gregory. And by this time, the local comedians were calling me the Malcolm X of comedy by now. That's hard. They were doing it as a joke, you know, because Black Ron get on stage, he's liable to say something deep. He be killing the crowd, and then he liable to want to preach at the end. Why this nigga just can't do jokes? I don't know. He just got to preach for 10 minutes at the end. 
And then you the Malcolm X of comedy, and it took off as a joke. And then I just adopted it. Like, no, but for real, I am. Because if you look at Malcolm in his life and, and what he what, what led to the man he became, so, the story's almost the same with me. So now I got Dick Gregory right in front of me, who tells me, I heard you call yourself the Malcolm X of comedy. Wow. Yes, sir, I do. Well, you know, I knew that man. He was one of my best friends. That's all right. Yes, sir, I know that. But if you're going to wear his name, don't do his name no disservice. That's big. Don't put no stain on that man's name. So from that point on, comedy was live or die with me. If I wasn't going to make it doing this, we're going to make it doing nothing else. Then I get a phone call from my man, Derek Keenum. Shout out to Derek Keenum. He said, hey, man, I'm writing for WBLS for Earthquake's radio show because he was featuring for Earthquake at the time. Got a radio segment and they need some quick little one-liners. I know you're good at them. Send me a couple of them. I just text about four or five of them. Send them in. Turns into a writing job for Earthquake's first radio show. Mm. Big. Quake comes to Dallas. Derek can't make it. I fill in for Quake. Right then at that same moment, Derek stops featuring for Quake. Quake needs a feature. You. Proved myself that weekend. Hey, young, you want to go on the road with me? Three years in a row, I'm on the road with Earthquake. Wow. By featuring for Quake, I meet all the OGs. But by also, Earthquake was the first time, because everybody else, I got fired. I would do two or three shows and get fired for being Why? too funny. They don't want you to take their spotlight. You not real? you not here to be funny. Faison Cat I mean uh Faison say Cat Williams pushed him away from the show because he thought he couldn't he could come behind Faison. Faison tells me this and I understand what you saying now because he's saying he can't go behind me. He didn't know what he was dealing with. The first comedian to ever give me love for being funny was Rodney Perry. The first uh -huh. comedian to, to to promote me from the the Host spot to the feature spot because the host couldn't even get his credits right was Lil Rel. Mm. Those were the first two dudes to actually give me a, a stamp of a validation stamp. when it came to working at the white people comedy clubs. So the white comedy clubs would never book me because I wouldn't go through their process. That's why I say I don't encourage nobody to take my route. What is their process? I, I, I did it the bar and grill, legends, real time, brick house lounge. I'm going to the black clubs. Right. I'm doing black comedy. Uh -huh. The white but club isn't that comedy route. Normally, rally. what no black comedians normally do? That's what black comedians normally did. Okay. So just because you black skin don't make you a black comedian. That's why you'll have black comedians that you've never heard of take mm -hmm. off because they were mainstream comedians. They worked the white rooms. They went to the white clubs. So when you go to Hyenas or the Improv on Open Mic Night, they'd have a stand, uh, sign up sheet about 40, 50 names long. No matter what time you showed up, the person there decides where you where you going. Mm -hmm. So they don't fuck with you. They're gonna put you on fourth block, which is the last 10 names. Wow. So you might get there 7 p.m. to sign up. You ain't going on till one in the morning. Mm. And I did this week after week, even though I'm the funniest dude in the room. Another thing they would do, the gatekeepers. So while the club is full of people that came to see a comedy show, they're going to put their friends up, mm. bombing their ass off. She just couldn't joke their way out of a one-stall bathroom. Have you ever seen somebody get booed off stage? Absolutely. He been booed off stage. No. But he bombed. Yes. Okay. But not booed. But not booed. And damn sure not off stage. <laughs> <laughs> no, that, that's giving up. That's real. That's yeah. giving up. And I, I, I'm going to do my time. You're going to have to cut my mic off before mm. I walk off stage. I will never let the boo, I will never let the crowd ruin my check. I'm booked to do a certain amount of time. I'm going to do my time. Now, you not, I, I wasn't booked for you to like me. I was booked to do my time. Right. So the only way I can get my money is if I do all of my time. Oh, okay. That's mm -hmm. real. So that's I'm learning now. Mm -hmm. Let's go. So that's when you start to get afraid because it's all about paying bills. So the next time you get a, a feature opportunity, it's bad enough that clubs don't fuck with you. It's bad enough that you don't play their game because you realize that it's rigged. So you making a name for yourself and you going around the country building relationships with these comics without doing it their, the white folks way. Mm -hmm. So then when these headliners come to town, they telling the club, no, I want Black Run to feature for me. So now the club got to break Have down to. and call me. 
Yeah. Which is why I would be fourth or fifth or sixth on the call list when the when the headline would say, I need a black comedian to open for me. Even though black is my first name and my stage name, I'm number six or seven on the list, even though I'm at the top of the heap as, as far as skill. Is that why you named yourself Black Run? Well, yeah, because I'm proud of myself. But I named myself Black Run because when I was in the hood, living my hood life, everybody called me black. Okay. And then when I would be doing my corporate life, everybody would call me Run. So my dichotomy is both of those. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm black to some and I'm run to others. I'm black run to everybody. Got it. So working with Quake, Quake see me on stage half-stepping. He pulled me to the side in the dressing room. He said, hey, young, when I first saw you in Dallas, this ain't what I saw. Mm. I said, well, OG, I was doing a guest spot in Dallas. I never thought I would be working with you. He said, you say that to say what? I said, man, I'm just trying to play my part. He say, I ain't one of them cats. I didn't bring you here to, to pity pat the, the, the room. I didn't bring you here to pacify the audience. I and brought that you was here. because of what had happened previously. Yes, ma'am. When you got fired because of being too funny. Not for being late, not for smoking, not for cussing too much. You know gave me the most rules as a headliner? Don't do this, don't say this, don't do no. that. Don't. T. K. Kirkland. Really? T to the mother thudding K. Why he do that? Why? Well, because... A lot of comedians, headliner comedians thing is they don't want to work hard. And some of them don't want to overrun the room. So if he going to do a whole bunch of sex jokes, he going to do a whole bunch of bitching and hoeing. He going to do a whole he bunch of... He don't want you to do He don't want thing. you to do it too because now the crowd is ran down. They, they, they've heard right. too much of that. So his jokes lose their sting if that was your material too, especially if you're going to be on stage for 30 minutes before him. But do you think that makes sense? It makes a whole lot of right. sense. But at the same time, it, it also comes from a place of fear, if you ask me. Because if your material was strong, it don't matter what you was talking about on stage before me. I don't care if you set a dog on fire right in front, right before you said my name. The minute the song plays and I go up there, I'm finna erase that whole chalkboard and teach a new lesson. That's just my take on it. Mm. And I learned that from the OGs and the dogs that I worked with from Quake and then from then on. Mm -hmm. Quake say, man, I didn't bring you here to pussyfoot. I brought you here to push me. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to work, work a new special. I'm trying to get a new hour together. I need you to push me. Mm -hmm. So then I started going on stage dogging it. So then I'm sitting in the back, and because I'm an Earthquake fan, I'm watching his show every show. And you saw the way how you pushed him. You saw that. I saw where I pushed him, and then I also saw ways like, oh, oh, gee, if you didn't say it like this, but if you said it like that, I think you might have a stronger response from the crowd. So you were Because I'm a him. student of the game. So I'm starting to punch his jokes up. And at first he's like, young nigga, who are you to give me a punch up? And then he say, I, I'm, I, I texted to him. He say, spit it to me. You know, don't, don't write it to me. Say it to me how mm -hmm. it should be said. And I told him to joke the way he should say it. And he slapped the steering wheel. And he said, boy, you got something. And that night, in his set, he told the joke my way instead of his way. And everybody cracked up. When he got the response, he looked off stage and looked at me and nodded his head. I didn't know I had just got hired. <laughs> I just thought I got validated. Like, yeah, nigga, that was funny. Mm -hmm. From that mo moment on, then I became a trusted counsel. So when he would write a joke, he, Young, what you think, what about, you think this? about this? And that's validation right that's there. Hard, when the OG, a man who been doing this long, as, as long as you've been alive, but who been professionally doing this, as long as you've been knowing what stand-up is, now values your opinion, all the rest of you local niggas can't tell me nothing. Mm -hmm. So from that, I, when he would introduce me to people, this is my young gunner. He write for me. And you know, a lot of comedians won't even tell that. No. Just like musicians and entertainers, according to them, they, they write everything. That's ego. So, True greatness has no problem acknowledging the people who help you make be great. Henry Ford had that concept. That's right. I'm going to put myself in a room full of great people, and what comes from that, we are going to be... You know what I'm saying? That's what they say. Mm -hmm. The sum is greater than its individual parts. Right. If you surround yourself with great people, y'all going to make something that's greater than any one of y'all could have ever did individually. That's real. I think you, you, God already been preparing you. Even to, even at the fact of like when you got on stage the other night and 
you and Chico Bean was going back and forth, you know, playing the, you know, the, at the end, back and forth. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, you know, um, you already been doing that since you were young. But I love Chico for that, man, because yeah. he shows the crowd that we equals in that. That's moment. hard, ain't it? I was I, I respect him and I love him for that because like like especially anytime we perform in Dallas, he goes out of his way to be like, hey Dallas, this guy is from here. This is one of y'all's own, and, and and you should love and support him just as much as you do me, if not more, because he's from here. Mm-hmm. And then after that, we roast to show the people I'm not just his opener, I'm his colleague. That's right. And I, shout out to Bean, shout out to DC Young Fly, who also does DC that does with that me too. on stage. Yeah, I, I tour with Fly quite regularly. Um, I tour with Ricky Smiley regularly. Did a few shows with Corey Holcomb after I stopped really? opening. For, after I stopped touring with Quake. Quake started doing um, Quake's House, the radio show, and uh, it just came to that graduation point. You know, I, I learned all I could learn from him. We had accomplished all we could accomplish. Now it's time for me to go off and fly high. Right. Now, now, now I have what it takes to be a headliner in my own right. Mm-hmm. Now it's time to leave the nest. When I left the nest, he put me in the hands of other people who needed writers. Put me in the hands of people like Kim Whitley. Brought me on, had me write for it. Put me in the hands. Put Bump me into people like Bob Sumner. That's hard. I love the fact that you're a writer because at the end of the day, if you decide, I don't want to do no more stand-up, you could write for the rest of your life and be good. Because the fame is about ego. Mm-hmm. I've gotten everything I can get from comedy. Mm-hmm. Number one, I was I was the type of dude that could pull a pretty lady before comedy, so <laughs> comedy didn't validate Excuse me, Miss Jamaica. Comedy <laughs> didn't help me get no more hoes. You know what I'm saying? Like it didn't it didn't validate me in that regard. Mm-hmm. And I was already a secure man within myself because I had spent 25 years with a chipped tooth right in the front of my mouth. So I was already a very secure person within myself. So comedy didn't do that for me. But I wanted a way to make my daughter proud of me. That's all. How old is your daughter now? She just turned 12. Shout out to my baby Lonnie. That's the motivation you need. That, that's my motivation, bro. And I thought that, too, because in the beginning when you were saying that the year she was born is the year you started comedy. Mm-hmm. So that's what made me feel like she made you get up off your butt and the push. Well, she gave me the, 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 she gave me the license to fail. Because mm. remember, when I started comedy, I didn't know whether right. or not I was going to be good at this. But once I figured out I was good at it, about a year into it, I was able to quit my job and just be like, well, I'll just be broke. I just won't have no money coming in so I can dedicate everything to this comedy, which is why I don't suggest and, and recommend nobody do that. You know what I mean? People wouldn't do that having a child. Most of most comedians that you know still got a day gig. Mm. It's real. Been on TV, been in movies and everything and still... Goddamn desk manager at Avis Rental Car. And wow. you've never had to have a regular job after that moment. Thank ever God, again. since Labor Day 2012, I have not put in 40 hours consecutively for nobody. That's wow. a blessing. It's a real blessing. Um, you. But I was homeless. You was homeless. In doing that, you know what I mean? Baby mama slept was able to paint me or in slept a picture. Or, or slept. Slept, slept in my ex fiance's 2009 Ford Focus That's many old. a night. That's hard. Many a night, dog. So what does your daughter say little... about you now? Oh man, you can't you can't find a bigger Black Run fan than my daughter. That's big. You know what I mean? Because no matter what you say about her daddy, she know she can go on any search engine, type in her daddy's name, she's gonna find pictures of him, not just selfies, Getty images mm-hmm. of her father. Wow. She's gonna find. 30 minute special on epics of her father. She's going to find one hour special that he self produced on his own. She's going to see uh, podcasts and shows that have millions of views. She's going to see clips that got millions of views. And then, more so than anything, when we out in public and somebody walks up on me and say, What's up, Black Run? Yeah. He love you. Daddy, they know you. You ask my baby, what, what, what do her daddy do? Oh, he's a comedian. His name is Black Run. He makes people laugh, and she's been proud to say that Dope. since she was three years old, dog. Dope. I, I just, like I said, um, learning so much. I, I, I feel like uh, Boss Talk One Hundred and One. Um, our people that listen to this show and hearing your story is going to erupt something in the ones who want to follow and, and line up with comedy to where they it gives you drive and motivation when you hear things put in a way 
coming from a person. It comes from a genuine place. Yeah. You know, so I think that's live, man. That's what we all about. You know, that's what boss talk about is basically getting us in front of our people so they can see that they can do it. You know what I'm saying? You don't have a problem getting in front of people like week in and week out, like with, 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 with as small of a forehead as you have, like your <laughs> edge up. No, I was playing, man. No, I, I just had to go. You see, because you weren't expecting that one. I had to hit I, you in you your real. I, I baby. really, I'm, I'm one of them guys, man, that kind of, I don't know. I've been, I've been through it, so I ain't much gonna get me off guard. So let me, ask, let me ask you this question, because true survivors know this to be true. That was that moment when it looked like everything that you had gambled on was a loss. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. Where you was going to prove all your doubters right. Yeah. When everything finally happens, is it just me or you don't get no satisfaction from rubbing it in people's face? Yeah, no, it, it really it's more of a humbling thing, to be honest with you. It's a thing where... From my, I, I'm a big believer in God, so mm -hmm. it's a thing where, from where I came from, looking back where I am now to where I came from, all glory go to Him. Right. So I don't really even get amused with the people as much as I get amused with God. When I get on my knees at night mm -hmm. and my wife come get on her knees beside me and we pray and we know where we came from and we know who we are, yeah. I think that's bigger than anything any person could ever even remotely influence. You know what I mean? So I don't look at it from a people's perspective at all. I think the last time I counted, I had somewhere uh, around 15 or 16 on on screen, on camera credits, you know, full productions. Yeah. Uh, one HBO comedy festival, you know what I'm saying, was in talks with HBO to do a special mm -hmm. development deal from NBC. Mm -hmm. You know, been, been all those places, done all those things. Yeah. The most rewarding thing for me right. is the fact that I get to do this. The mm. biggest perk that I still get is the fact that I get free admission into comedy shows. When it's all said and done, dog, I'm still a kid that loves stand-up comedy that was that would risk getting a whooping to stay up late and watch Comic View, uh, that would sneak and watch Def Jam and sneak and listen to albums that I wasn't supposed to listen to, you know, Red Fox party records, Richard Pryor party records, things Dolomite. like that. Dolomite, you know, everybody, that, anybody that had anything that pig meat, Markham, uh, 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 here come the judge, uh, Pastor David Banks, uh, Millie Jackson, Moms Mabley. Yeah. Betty Wright, give us some props. Well, no, because Betty wasn't doing comedy. No, no, but she was, she, she was, she was a little, she was a little on the edge. Oh, she was edgy. She was but edgy. See, Millie was filthy. Millie was very filthy. Millie was filthy. Like there were certain things that children was just not supposed to listen to. <laughs> That's right. George Clinton albums were not intended for children. <sighs> That's true. At all. And my mama collects albums. And she had those. And she had all of these albums. And I would like do things like alphabetize her albums and stuff like that. Like, because I was just a nerd like that. But I was, in doing so, I'm sitting there and I'm reading all these album covers. I'm absorbing all this material that's filthy. I'm listening to these jokes. I'm listening to these grown folks' conversations. And I understand what they're talking about. It's funny to me. Then, you know, all kids cuss. Yeah. So then when I get around my friends, I'm killing them. Cause these niggas ain't heard none of this that I'm kicking off. But see, the, but the whole thing is, and I didn't mean to cut y'all, but the whole thing is, God was preparing you for mm -hmm. what you're doing now back then, and that's so dope. Just like I said, when you and your you and your brother would play, you know, whoever laughed first. That's that's God preparing you. He always does it in a way where you don't even know it's happening, but at the end you understand exactly what happened. Do you know what that game prepared me for the most? What performing in front of a crowd that ain't feeling you. Mm -hmm. That's hard. That's hard. Because I don't get unnerved when people ain't laughing immediately. Yeah. Because yeah. I know I'm going to win the game eventually. Man. I know that sooner that or later, sense. I'm going to hit you with one that's going to crack you. I'm going to bust you. And once I see that weakness, I'm going to exploit that. And before I know it, I got you rolling on the floor. Man. That's that's, that's a good game. to Y'all need to start playing that game if y'all getting into this business because that's that's a really good game. That's it. But who is the most funniest comedian to you because you to, to me no hold on hold on um because 
since you're in the craft, mm-hmm. anything that you're you're doing, you're not just listening to them like how we listen to them. Right. You're listening to them in more of an in-depth mm-hmm. way. Who is the most funniest, like, you can't stop laughing comedian you've ever seen? Oh, oh okay. I thought you were asking me who's the best at stand-up comedy. No, the funniest, as in, like, so what's the difference? Oh, I'm so glad you asked. That's like asking me who's the best NBA player versus who's the best basketball player I've ever seen. Like, there's a difference between hooping and playing ball right. and playing professional ball, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So, like, there are cats that, that are phenomenal at this at this craft of comedy, that, that, that write and craft a joke so good, it's like, oh, that's great, that's brilliant. And then there but are dudes not, that are they're just... they're not super funny. Right, like when, okay. like, when I watch a Dave Chappelle special, mm-hmm. I don't watch Dave to laugh. Okay. I watch Dave to watch Dave take something that shouldn't be laughed at and make it funny. Mm. And make you go, or, or make you go, mm. Because that's just as deep as a belly laugh. Mm-hmm. So, but the comedian that makes me just laugh until I can't breathe, yeah, Tony Roberts, hands down. Really, Tony, Tony Roberts. Roberts. Well, they're still alive. I'm, I'm gonna give you names right, of comedians that are still living. Tony Roberts. After him, Mike Epps, because mm-hmm. they have such a free flowing, non jointed comedy style. There's no segue. There's no subject matter. Really, it's just joke after joke after joke after joke after joke of things that make you just. Laugh. It's just absurd. Then there's cats like Jamie Foxx, who are not only good at telling a joke, but they're good at painting a picture, and he can sing the song, mm. and then he can actually do the voice mm. and impersonate the person that he's telling you about. So he wraps you completely in what Into he's doing. It. So that you know, there's different categories. Then right. there there are people that that are just really charismatic. You just really want to hear what they got to say. They take on things. You know what I mean? Those those are your yeah. people like your cat, your cat Williams. You know, those are people like your Bernie Max. Eddie Griffin was the first person that I've ever seen that um, made me think. Mm-hmm. You know it's what not I mean? E- it's not illegal yet. It made me think. I had to pull up my phone. Nobody else, everybody else, I just laugh and it was funny and stuff like that. He actually made me like pull up my phone and like research. Like, mm-hmm. I never heard of that. Like, is that true? Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Griffin is in my GOAT category. Mm-hmm. See, there are certain people like Eddie, certain people like Dave, certain people like Red Fox, George Carlin, Dick Gregory, Bill Burr. Mm. Those are the cats that that transcend just making you giggle. Those are the cats that that become philosophers. But when you guys talk about comedy, right, and then you you talk about these guys that are so talented, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Then you catch a guy like Kevin Hart who comes up a whole different way. Mm. Right. That's fly as hell to me. Right, because Kevin showed you about, about marketability. You see what I'm saying? He mm. bad because for him to create his own wave and lane the way he does it, mm-hmm. it's different, bro. Okay, I'll, I'll put it is to that, you like that, this. You see where I'm coming from? Because they good. Everyone y'all said that these are spectacular people, but for him to come up slow but go, but then bam, that's hard, man. You're- Kevin Hart is the Nelly of the comedy game. You explain that. When the time Nelly came out, we were at, on the cusp of the end of the gangster rap era. And we were going into the Jiggy era, the mm-hmm. Bling Bling era. And Nelly came along and he was just commercial enough to where white people didn't mind singing songs about dealing drugs. And right when Nelly came along, if you were too gangster, you weren't commercial enough. You was too poppy. You were still too corny for the streets. So you wasn't all the way corny like a Will Smith, a Nick Cannon, you know, cats like the streak in can't believe you really doing this. And he's also not zero. You know what I mean? He ain't gangster, but he's he's right on the edge of both of them. He do a little song right here. And then next song got everybody doing the chicken head and everything like that. Mm -hmm. And he made himself marketable. Apple bottom jeans. Vocal clothes, uh, brought the St. Lunatics around, brought his whole team around, kept his whole team around. Everything was all about hiring from within. But then once he became a superstar, got the prettiest girl, and then it was all about making opportunities for everybody else. Mm-hmm. Kevin Hart did that same thing. Kevin Hart was necessar- not ever necessarily the funniest dude in the black comedy club, nor was he the squeaky clean white comedy club black comedian either. He was just street enough to do black jokes at a white club, mm-hmm. which made him very marketable. Because when white people find you likable, now you are something they can sell. 
the minute he became a big household name, brought the Plastic Cup Boys with him. Kept the Plastic Cup Boys with him. As he elevated, brought them along. And then the minute he became a superstar, he started Heartbeat Productions, mm. where he's able to give opportunities to everybody else. My first time ever being on TV, the reason why y'all know me right now, the reason why I got more TV credits than everybody else is because of a cat named Kevin Hart. Wow. Because he had a guy in his camp named Joey Wells. That's a plastic cup boy. That's one of his writers. That's one of his trusted, close allies. And Joey said, I got an idea for a TV show where we go around the country and we find the funniest local comedians and we put them on. But I need you to put your name on it, Kev, so that it can get on TV. And they named the show Heart of the City. Mm. And I was on Heart of the City season two. The Dallas episode, episode three. And then you got a chance to meet Kevin. But one of the stipulations for the thing was the only way you can get on the show is you got to have no TV experience, no TV creds. Mm. So let's back it up. A year and a half before that, you had Robert Powell, comedian who had just moved here to Dallas, had a TV show on Magic Johnson's network, Aspire, mm -hmm. had booked me to be on his TV show. But because I was flying on a buddy pass, I got stuck in Hartsfield, Atlanta Man. Airport. Well, God. Yeah. But God got, it, God got it working. So just because it don't happen when you thought it was supposed to happen don't mean it didn't happen when it was supposed to happen. Y'all hear that? You don't know what God has in store. And a lot of times we get frustrated at the moment because of what's going on and not realizing. Like I tell my daughter all the time, anytime you go through anything in life, it's a Think of it as a lesson. Don't think of it as a disappointment mm. or anything like that because you're going to get stressed and right. anxiety and whatever. Right. Think of it as a lesson that God is trying to teach you. Mm -hmm. And then be patient. You just learned something. Now, he prepared you for a ne next step that might come two years, three years, four years. But you just have to keep working because you got to meet him halfway. Wow. Do you know why fruits and vegetables grow mostly underground? Why? Or, or under coverings. Why? Even the, even the fruit that you can see on trees, it grows in a pod, in a covering, because you can't see it. Reason being is because if you could monitor the progress, you would never be proud of the harvest. See, everything goes on underground. You can't see what's going on. You just hope. You just trust that that seed that you put in the ground, that little sprout that came out that showed you a little promise, that little stalk with them little flowers on it that get pollinated, ready, you you watering it and, and make sure it got enough light in it. You just praying, Lord, please, please, Lord, because if this don't turn out, I'm going to die of hunger and starvation. But I took my last little bit of money, and mm -hmm. rather than buy some fruits and vegetables from the store, I bought some seeds. In other words, rather than continue to eat on handouts from my other friends and family that are on, quit asking your partner that made it to put you on. Ask him to give you a seed instead. Quit asking the people that are already blessed sitting at their table, eating their blessings, reaping their benefits from their hard work to give you a portion of that. But Ask him for some dirt in a hoe so you can go do it yourself. That's so many times people, I think... People block out certain things. Just like how you're talking and you're dropping jewels and you're, you're giving so much information. Some people will take that and be like, man, I need to hit him up. What can I get? Can he put me on here? Can he do that? Instead of taking the information and doing their research and saying, okay, I'm going to do this now. I'm going to Because people that. think that there's a magic recipe to success. People think that there's a magic spell. Like if I say these 17 words in this specific order, that everything is going to happen perfectly for me. If I do these things the same way that that person did it, I'm going to get the same thing that that person got. No, you're not. Because you're not them. And you didn't have the experiences and the life that they had that led up until the old exactly. point. Like every decision you make is based off of the person that you are and everything that happened to you before that moment. Mm -hmm. Bro, if you didn't live the same life, I could give you, I could teach you, I could give you the, 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 the Coke, I could give you the pot, the spoon, and the baking soda that I used. But if you don't know how to whip, you're not going to get the same crack. But, um... Okay, coming up, mm -hmm. the friends that you had in the beginning that helped you to get where you are, the person that gave you um, a place to stay in Atlanta, mm -hmm. gave you the money, do you still talk to them today? Absolutely. 
<laughs> my day ones are my day one. Shout out to my dog Celebrity, my Ace Boom Coon, my best friend in comedy. We pushed each other out of legends. We pushed each other to become stars. Because how many times you see people that I've spoken to people who say, oh, I don't even talk to this person anymore because mm-hmm. they've gotten too big. They've forgotten all about me, but I was the person who helped them to get to where they are. Well, I feel two ways about that. Okay. There's a difference between being there when I started and helping me get to where I am. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, there were people at the hospital when you were born, but they didn't help your mama deliver you. They was just there at the hospital. So just because you was there in my infancy don't mean that you helped cultivate me or helped me get to where I am. You were just present. I'm talking about just like that person who gave you the money or gave you a place to stay or, you know. Right. Because if it wasn't for that, you probably would not have not gotten the urge at that moment to, to go to Atlanta at that time. Right. So to that I say, if what you were doing for me in my career and in my life was from a genuine place, then the fact that I made it is the blessing that you should be thankful for. The fact that you know that when you invested in me, when God told you, hey, bless that man right there, you know that you weren't sowing seed on bad ground. That's your blessing. If you were doing it for a return, then you weren't doing it from a good place. You weren't doing it from a holy place. Now, I don't think that you should forget about people that looked out for you, but there should be a cap on that also. Because what's enough? If I looked out for everybody that, that, that did something for me uh, uh, in my life as a look, if I looked out for the dude that didn't rob me when I was 17, he, he let me get on the train and go home. If I look out for the girl, first girl that gave me some coochie, if I look out for the the, 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 the rent office lady who, who didn't put me out on the 19th, she put me out on the 24th. So give me uh, three more days to have somewhere to stay. You know, so at, at what point do you go back and, and, the $100 investment that you put in my life 10 years ago shouldn't equate to a $100,000 kickback right. now that I'm on. And I wasn't even talking about money-wise and stuff like that. I was even I was just talking about something as simple as calling every now and again and say, hey, bro, like I ain't forgotten if about you. If you've been you, in my life, Miss Jamaica, ain't no such thing as you can't get a hold of me. The people that say that are the people that stop talking to you until you got on. Mm-hmm. Then now they want to call this number to see if it still work. Usually because they stunting in front of somebody else about the fact that they know you and that they've been knowing you since you wasn't shit. Oh, you don't believe me? I'll call this number right now. Mm-hmm. Hey, bro, what's up? It's me. Who the fuck is me? Me from 35 years ago. I helped you get started. <laughs> don't you remember me? Mm-hmm. Oh, oh, you brand new. No, nigga, there have been other people who have done other things for me in the 35 years since That's that real. time you told me you got what it take and gave me $5. That's real. If you were constant in my life, ain't no such thing as you you know, you don't know how to get in touch with me. That's why I have three phone numbers. That's Personally, real. I got I got a, I got a 469 number. Which, which is for all of the people that knew me before I took off. I have an 818 number, which is Los Angeles, mm-hmm. for all of the people that met me after I became... Industry. Industry. Mm-hmm. And then I have a 214 number that is the bat phone that only my immediate family and close friends have that number Makes to. sense. If you call my 214 number, like, like to the point where my family knows, my immediate family knows... Don't call that 214 number if you just want to holler at me because that's a stop everything phone. And if you just stopping everything to say, hey, mama said, is you going to be in town next week? You could have called me on the other two phones that y'all also have numbers to. But if my family can respect the fact that sometimes I don't pick up my phone, not because I don't feel like talking to you, but because I might be taping a show on one of the coldest podcasts in the country. Or That's I might us. be performing on stage. Whoop, whoop. Nigga, run, nigga. <laughs> you heard what he said. You know what I mean? My mama will call me, hey, Black Run, you busy. She'll do it just to be teasing me. But if my mama respects the fact that her son has a job where he's a public figure now, then that nigga I ain't talked to since the last time I talked to him, fuck what he going through. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but most of the time, like you say, that's just somebody trying to, you You get that, you know. Um, how can people get a hold to you, my guy? Like run if they trying to reach out and try to you know mm. book you or trying to link up now, with you. If they want to book me, I used to say call me directly, but praise God, we got a team a now. Yeah. We got a team now, you know what I'm saying? Shout out to Boss Lady Management, you know oh. what I'm saying? The coldest management company in the country. She represents some of the most premier comedy acts 
in the country, and I'm just glad to be part to, that I'm on her roster. You know what I mean? So she think enough of me to have me on there with the likes of Chico Bean. Darren Big Baby Brand, Osama been drinking. She's the manager of the 85 South Show Tour. Uh, uh, her first client was Earthquake. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> wow. So I, I've been walked in, you know what I'm saying? Right. Everybody everybody that, that grabs me walks me to the next phase of my career. Mm-hmm. So I thank all the people that had something to do with Black Run getting into this chair you know what I mean so but if you're gonna follow me and if you wanna book me holla at boss lady management be sure you talk to boss lady send me an email I'll direct you to her Um, what's your email my email black.run.comedy at gmail and it's black with a Q Thank you, Ms. Jamaica, because I know I know EC ain't gonna put it right here on my chest <laughs> in post production. Black with a Q. He ain't gonna right, drop right, the right. words right here. Not he probably ain't that. gonna spell it right right here on my head on no, the no, thumbnail. No, 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 I'm not gonna do that, but I'm gonna have you right. I could promise you that. But uh, boss talk one on one. What a boss just put him out there. But yeah. <laughs> also, um, let me say this about people that want a book. If you if you real about this, because I, I I believe in helping black businesses and, and small business owners, especially promoters, especially the ones that's trying to get off the ground. But bro, you gotta have your ducks in a row. You can't call me talking about what can I get you for? No, dog, no, because you wouldn't do that to nobody else. It's, and so don't don't act like because I'm from the town, because I'm from here, because you've been knowing me, because you've been rocking with me ever since, that we can't do business the legitimate way, mm-hmm. aka white folk business. And I don't have to have a team of white folk behind me in order for us to do white folk business. My whole team, from my manager to my assistant, my publicist, my merchandise uh, agent, my travel agent, everybody is a black woman. That's all. And we changing the world. A black woman. A black woman. My whole team is black women. You feel me? Why no males? Um, Because uh, I can have a disagreement with a member of my team. We can talk to each other crazy and we know that it's love. And I know that because that's a lady, I'm never going to get out the way with her. I'm never going to be all the way in my emotions. And I, I that, that allows me to realize that she's not talking about me personally. She's talking about me professionally. So get my ego and my emotions out of it because this is business that we talking. Mm-hmm. But if with a dude, if he can get on the phone telling me I'm fucking up or I should have been there or why I do this or you, tomorrow you need to be over here like you running me. No, dog, come outside. Who you talking to? <laughs> No, it's just really self awareness is all you speaking on. Yeah, you and understand. I'm not disciplined you enough understand. to have a dude. You understand yeah. who he is, so I mean, I'm good with that. I need a I, black woman to be like, get your ass up and get to the airport before you be to miss your damn flight. You right, you are so right. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah. I have one more question. Go ahead. Um, because you said comedy, you've done it all in comedy. Mm-hmm. Um, what's your next step? Whereas, are you gonna go off into the movie industry? I don't know. I can't act. I've been acting since I was ten. So I've done everything from commercials, small TV, small plays, and stuff like that. But honestly, I see you playing a preacher. Well, thank you. They let the church say. But uh, honestly, man, whatever I can do to put a stamp on the game, I want to change the culture of comedy. I want to be regaled as one of those philosophers. Mm-hmm. Like when you think about like who gonna be on the Mount Rushmore of comedy? I want my name in that conversation. That's all. Mm-hmm. So I don't necessarily need to be in no movie to do that. I don't necessarily need to be in no TV show to do that. Because Bernie Mac wasn't in none of them. Mm. And he's still Bernie Mac. You feel what I'm saying? Man. Oh, and you can follow me on Christian Mingle, too. <laughs> Deacon Longstroke. That's my handle. Uh, <laughs> no, but Facebook, YouTube. Uh, my publicist got me a new Instagram. They banned me off Instagram for over Again? a year. For being too pro-black, bro. I had have no naked women on my page or nothing. I wasn't doing none of that. I was black. just talking about pro-blackness and... Yeah, telling black people to love ourselves. And, and and during, that's when I found out TikTok was racist. Because during the 2020 riots and the George Floyd trial and everything like that, if you put hashtag RIP George Floyd or hashtag Black Lives Matter on your TikTok, they would just delete that post. Mm. So I'm like, wait a minute, ain't no app from China finna tell me that they don't care about my black existence. Oh, well then I'm not finna help you be great. Right. I'll be on fan base. Shout out to Isaac Hayes. <laughs> man. Hey, man, um, we enjoyed you. You Thank one you. Of them, you one of them guys, man. I appreciate you for all the uh, all the different things you did that I feel going to enlighten people. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's going to help people. You ain't, gonna, you, ain't gonna, you ain't really going to rock with me till you see these views. 
No, I don't really care about views. I'm one of them different niggas, man. I don't. I don't well, think why I ain't get you get invited to the barbecue then? Tell him. You better tell him what's going down. I heard he's seeking barbecue. I ain't Bruh, got invited to now. I'm barbecue. telling you, is shout out to Sir Charles Jones who he invited me. Shout out to the guy who brought me over and cooked big, big, big meals for us, didn't mm-hmm. he? And so you need to cook. You know what I'm saying? Well, that's what people know me for. <laughs> for people, real cooking. I was a chef for five years before comedy. That's hard, man. Because I was fat. I, I was fat in college. Really? Bro, I was 275 pounds in college, dog. But you can't even say that because you tall. So 275 not going to look like a regular When you a nigga with hips, you fat. (laughs) I don't care what nobody (laughs) say. You got a juicy body as a man. It is never a good thing. Man, thank you so much for coming on the show. We love you, bro. Man, I appreciate it, man. Thank y'all for having me. You know what I'm saying? And I don't care what they say about you after this. I'll fight for you now. Bro, you know, the way you came at me at the place, I know we good. Because once you get into it with a nigga, then once y'all That's how we friends. It, then yeah. it, it be stronger. It's a stronger man. I one. want somebody to say something about Boss Talk now. <laughs> See how I slap him across their lip. Hey, me. man, I just thank you for even uh, coming on the show, spending time with us this evening. For, for real, real, for real. And uh, like I said, man, I know it's going to help people, man. That's my biggest thing. That's why we did this is because we know that y'all's story Need to be heard, bro, in a way to where it can help some people, right? Mm-hmm. So check it, man. It's been another great segment, segment of, of what? Boss Talk 101, where what the a, boss what? is talking. What a, why are we on Boss Talk 101? Hey! <laughs>